Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts 8, verses 26 to 40, found on page 1149 in your pew Bible. That's the Bible in front of you. A little background to this, the person in scripture that we're mostly going to focus on here, his name, his name is Philip. He's introduced a little bit earlier. Um, Philip, uh, uh, my inclination is to think, oh, he's one of the apostles. Oh, wait, I don't remember that working right. Um, and you find out that there was an issue with the distribution of um, things to the widows, and they were asked, they kind of came up with the idea, we'll get seven righteous men. Philip is one of those seven righteous men who gets appointed to help with the distribution of these uh, um, resources. And then there is the stoning of Stephen, and as a result of the stoning of Stephen, the church there's tremendous persecution in the city of Jerusalem, and they scatter. And Philip is also one of the ones that scatters. But here we start with, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go down to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Morning. <laughs> this week we're going to talk about on fire following, just going out and keeping in step with the spirit. And so hence I'm going to combine two things that I like to do. One is rollerblading and the other is that I feel called to do of preaching. I'm going to try to preach on this just to convey the idea of keeping in step with the spirit. Of course, you never really know where Philip is in the passage, right? He's in Jerusalem. He's handing out bread. Next thing you know, he's in Samaria. And then he goes over to the desert road. And then he's in Azotus and he ends up Caesarea, you just never know where he is. And that's the one dynamic about on fire following that I'd like to point out this morning. And that is that it's, it's following Jesus Christ by his spirit. We have been on a journey. If you're just visiting this morning, if you're just attending with us, maybe for the first time in a long time, we've been on a journey these last four or five weeks. And we started on this, this uh, sermon series over here. And the emphasis on this sermon series is that we as a church need to make space 
and encourage people in all these four categories. The first one is seeking and finding. So before people come to Christ, we need to be encouraging and clear about what it means to follow Christ so that people are encouraged and not sort of turned off. The next one is growing and learning. And again here, we need to make a space for these people in our church to say, look, they may not have arrived morally, they may not have arrived doctrinally, but instead of saying, well, you're not quite like we are, we need to say, hey, this is good, and let the Spirit move them to where God's calling them to be. I should rollerblade more because I'm a bit out of breath, but <laughs> work on that. Okay, living and serving, this is a great dynamic. This is a great place to be. But as we can see in Scripture, what we're called to do is not just live and serve, we're called to step out in faith. And I have, I'm just going to, I kind of was going to use these, but I'm going to go right up here. Sometimes our worldviews and sometimes where we're at in our life can get us stalled. And so as we talked about last week, what we're called to do is not just stay stalled in our faith, but press on to what God has for us and figure out how to get our blinders off and maybe figure out what's holding us back by the Spirit as we look to the Word so we can follow Him through where we're called to be. Now this dynamic, this on fire following, I could probably call it something else, but it's this idea of keeping in step with the Spirit, this Christ-centeredness, this fully devoted thing. We're called to do this, but the reality that I want to point out right up front is there's probably aspects of our life in all four of these categories. Probably some ways we're just seeking, some ways we're just growing, some ways we're stuck in life, but the point this morning is that we're all called to this on-fire following in some area of our life as we walk in greater discipleship with God and as we keep in step with the Spirit. So we're going to do this this morning by looking at the story of Philip. Now Philip listens to the guidance of God. I probably won't fall, but if I do, hey, it'll be entertaining, right? <laughs> I've done this for a lot of years, but I haven't done this for a lot of years, but I've been rollerblading for a lot of years, so hopefully it'll work out. As we look at Philip, we see an example for the church. We see an example for us. We see how God moves, and because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the Spirit's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we're not all called to go down to Samaria to do signs and wonders, but we are all called to keep in step with the Spirit and follow him where he's leading each one of us. So looking at Philip here. Philip, first of all, he leads a successful ministry. As Marcia pointed out, he's up in Jerusalem first, handing out bread, persecution, so he goes down to Samaria. He's a Greek, so he probably didn't have a lot of the cultural um, ideas that the gospel wasn't for Greek people. But he goes down to Samaria, and there's amazing things happening. Signs and wonders. I don't know exactly what that means, but people are getting healed. God's probably showing up in spectacular ways. Just amazing ways. All right, so last week I was talking to Alicia, and she's like, you know, I'm just helping my neighbor out, but I just want to ask you a little bit, like, you're helping your neighbor out. What you doing for your neighbor? Well, um, I'm kind of helping them with laundry, dishes, mopping, rearranging bedrooms, knocking out walls, you know. Knocking out walls? Well, yeah. Really? Well, they have black mold. So that's, you're just going over there and helping them. Are you getting paid for this? Well, the, yeah, they are paying me, but... Oh, really? But that's not why you started doing it. Mm -mm. No, not at all. Um, so I, even, I even tried to refuse, and they were like, no, no, we insist. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So do, why, do, why do they need help exactly right now at this point in their lives? Well, the mom left the dad to go find another guy all the way in England. Mm. Just took off. Just took off. Left two kids my age. Yeah. Twins. They were devastated. Yeah. And so you're just going over there to help get their house back in order? Because he's disabled or something, isn't he? He, yeah, he has a messed up shoulder. The grandma has, uh, she actually has moved in. She has heart problems, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's an example. Really simple. Many of you are probably doing similar things. But is it your neighbor or your family now? Well, I knew them, but they're also my neighbor. Okay. So, okay. Both. So they need to hear the news. And here, Alicia, is good news for them. And it's pretty basic, pretty simple, but it's also listening, it's also obeying, it's also stepping out. And it's just the basic stuff that we're called to do. It's a good example. I want to pray for you as, as we uh, get okay. the next person. That's all right. And I'd invite you to pray with me. Dear God, we thank you so much for Alicia. And Lord, we ask that you would be with her in every area of her life. We ask that you would equip her 
to be who she's called to be and thank you that she's just stepping out in faith in a small way. We're not sharing these stories to put her on a pedestal that, that she's just uh, the cat's meow of Christianity, but we're asking that you fill her with the Spirit, help her in every area of life to be who she's called to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So, I, I don't know you that well. I know you're a teacher at Calvin Christian. I know you and your family were in Indonesia. And maybe you can just explain a little bit what you were doing and why you felt called to Indonesia in the first place. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, a bit of a tie-in to the sermon today. Um, the theme of the school, and, and the school before we went to Indonesia, was in New Mexico. Um, and, and the theme of that uh, sc Christian school year was um, based on a passage in, in Matthew, which was, Come Follow Me. And it was following the shepherd was the theme that school year. And uh, as our school year went on, and this is 2008, 2007-2008 um, school year, um, we explored that theme through a variety of, of ways and, and felt called to explore overseas um, work and we ended up in Indonesia for four years um, and certainly felt called to do that. And you were teaching there, right? Yeah, I taught at a Christian school in Indonesia for four years. So. And what, 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 uh, what kids were in part of that school there? Was it like Indonesian kids or like yeah, good, good question. Um, and, and again, this uh, a good tie-in. Um, the church is really growing in Jakarta, and even though Indonesia is a Muslim country, um, there's a large um, population of Christians in in the capital city. Most of them are Chinese ancestry, or you know, um, maybe not native uh, Indonesians, but they are Indonesian citizens now. And so the school that I taught at was um, almost exclusively um, Indonesian students um, who were Christians. Um, some were Muslim that I taught, some were Buddhist. Um, but it was a, a great opportunity to, to, um, to learn there as well as to minister. Um, and and it, was, it was just a, a powerful way of, of seeing the emerging church and seeing the work of God around the world. Um, and, uh, and then also contributing to it in, in small ways as we taught and lived there for four years. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing more of those stories at some point about how the church is growing there. It's mm -hmm. exciting. And so you felt called to come back here, and so what was that part of that call? What are you doing now? Yeah, about a year ago, in fact, almost exactly a year ago, we decided that it was time to leave Indonesia, and we wanted to come back, but we didn't. Uh, and we wanted to come to Michigan, even though we've never lived here as a married family. Um, we have aging parents here, and so, um, and then, then we sought God's call in that, and knowing that Michigan's not the greatest job market in the world, um, we, we then prayed, and, and uh, God opened doors again for us to move to Granville and to live in this community, so, it, and it's, it's just been a tremendous, again, tremendous uh, work of God to see how he works in our lives and, and called us here. So I was thinking as we talked to Capone a bit, there's an interesting parallel because Philip goes down to Samaria, he ends up traveling about, he ends up at Caesarea, and, and we learn later, it seems like he's raising a family there, he has some kids, and so it calls us to go a movement, but God calls us also to go elsewhere to you know, raise our family, which I'm sure kind of appreciates, and, um, and to be who we're called to be. And so I'm going to do something similar. Often uh, you come back from like a term of service, you get welcome back Sort of. Uh, yeah, we've been yeah. just enjoying family and enjoying awesome. the communities that we know here. So Awesome. I just want to do a bit of affirmation as a church for what you've been called to do. And even though we don't know that much, I love it just when people step out in faith. So if you'd repeat after me, and Steve and Janet, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Steve and Janet. Steve and Janet. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Thank you for following the Spirit. Thank you for following the Spirit. To where he led you to go. Thank you for continuing to follow in the Spirit. Thank you for continuing to follow in the Spirit. And coming here to Granville. Coming here to Thank you. So what do you do for a living? Um, 
I'm a therapist, psychotherapist. I work with children ages 12, all children, and young adults, 25. Most of them are substance abusers. I work with their families. Um, I also do uh, family therapy and marriage therapy, pre-marriage therapy. So you have a private practice, but you also work for Ottawa County. Really with some of the, like, the toughest yeah. cases I can probably make. Teenagers who have just been neglected and then abused and neglected and abused. And, Correct. And uh, so you get called into these situations with the suicide things and mm -hmm. you're the guy who gets called into these really just unbelievably mm -hmm. traumatic situations. Yeah, you wouldn't know until they share, but you know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Fine. Yeah. So the, the amazing thing when I you know, sort of learn about what Mark does is when I get into situations with people who need help, I ask for prayer, I ask for support, and Mark's just out there doing his job. I mean, his job is, you know. And so part of the reason, part of the motivation is I want us to be able to pray for Mark in that role as he just goes out and really gets into some of the toughest situations in management. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any on the sign up sheet set up, but I want to set up something where you might be able to get a text or an email when he's going into a situation without knowing details, just to pray for him that the spirit will mm -hmm. empower you. Um, it's just amazing. He's set on faith, and most of us probably didn't even know it. It's just, it's a, it illustrates this perfectly. The other thing is, uh, so you got a, in your private practice, you had a meeting the other day, and maybe you can tell me a little bit about that listening thing and just. Uh, okay. Um, actually, how it starts is two weeks ago on okay. Sunday night okay. Okay. when I asked the people that were at church to pray for me because I'm working with a young man who shared with me that he saw Satan in his room and he was actually physically frozen. He's laying on his bed, couldn't move, and was terrified by that. He's depressed and says the only reason he didn't commit suicide is because he doesn't want to go to hell. He wasn't going to let the Satan conquer him. <clears throat> um, this past week, I um, used what I learned from when Ted Coleman was here. In the past, I've really asked the Holy Spirit just to give me the words, Lord, because I don't know what I'm going to say in this situation. I've done that for some time. But I did use what I learned there in terms of removing Satan removing my own thoughts and allowing the Holy Spirit to ask or tell me what to pray for. Space, yes, this young man um, is very much in seeking and finding because we have talked about his faith. He's very much at that point. Um, the image I got was a swastika. I thought, nah. So I asked him, you know, what's, what have you seen or what, were, what went on while we were praying? And he talked about some past memories and stuff. And I told him the image I received, and he said, that's really strange because that's the very image I was thinking about this morning standing in my mother's kitchen. Well, how I tied that into is that he's very angry. He's been bullied. He's bitter, resentful. And... The swastika is about anger, about lashing out, those kinds of things. So together we prayed that that would be removed, that anger, that resentment and bitterness would be removed. He also then prayed for forgiveness for holding on to that sin. And Tuesday, we'll see. Yeah, the story continues, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Testimonies don't need a nice, solid end. It's just the story continues in God's um, we'll see where God goes. And what God placed on my heart this morning sitting here is a scripture. It says, that ties into what you're talking about. It says, you know, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Uh, the God of compassion, the Father of comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may comfort others in any trouble with the comfort we have received um, from Jesus. So, you know, as Jim talked about, our relationship with God is what dictates how we relate to others, and to me that's Christianity. 
and uh, focus of what I do every day. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have a congregation. May you truly know the love of the Father. May you know the salvation that is offered for you through Jesus Christ for really each one of us in our own unique situation. And may you be equipped by the Spirit to follow Him as we follow Him together. Amen.